battlefield that you see in front of you is the result of my months long battle, well actually three hours long battle with this telescope, which is horrible. It's a nightmare and I absolutely love it. This telescope is the Skywatcher Quattro 150P. It is a very cheap telescope. I bought it in Japan for a US dollar equivalent of 450 US dollars. And for that price, it came with this coma corrector that also acts as a reducer, which is fairly rare for Newtonian telescopes. And included in the price, it's a bit unheard of. Now, since then, I've learned a few things about why it was so cheap in Japan, cheaper than, for example, in the United States, where normally for astronomy and astrophotography equipment, I observe something completely different. It's typically much more expensive in Japan than the, in the United States, including for Chinese-made stuff. And the reason is the focuser that is included with my telescope, this, uh, this draw tube assembly effectively, is a cheaper end focuser on the Japanese model of that telescope versus the US model has a better uh, focuser and focuser draw tube mechanism, which is the same as in the bigger uh, versions of this telescope. So that's one thing where Skywatcher has some regional differences, which are very annoying by the way. Skywatcher, don't do that, seriously. Um, where I end up with a focuser draw tube that is more difficult to deal with than with the same telescope's US counterpart. So keep that in mind when I go through the video because the focuser assembly itself will likely be different than what you get if you buy it in the US. I am not sure what version you will get in Europe. So yeah. So anyway, now that I've told you that this telescope is a nightmare and it absolutely is, I really wish I had kept my Vixen R200SS, which was a Newtonian that did not require collimation. Such a, a really nice thing. And let me detail what I did to make this telescope better. In particular, the collimation was much more complex than I had expected. Let's start with some of the easy stuff. The aforementioned focuser draw tube. I removed the rough focusing knob so you can have a good look at the focuser uh, draw tube itself and how it is moved. Basically, as I rake the focuser in and out, you can see there is this flat part here that appears. And what's happening is that this smooth rod, it actually extends all the way to here as a, a continuous smooth rod. And it's just in contact with this flat surface. And by rotating and by pure uh, friction, it is moving the draw tube in and out. So obviously the amount of friction can be, uh, can be controlled by how much this rod is in contact with this flat surface here. And this is done using those three screws here at the center. So these are the three screws that we want to touch when adjusting this. And the left and right ones, they're both pull screws, meaning that if I tighten them, I actually pull the rod towards me and so further away from this flat part. So there is less contact between the two. And if I loosen them, then the reverse happens. By loosening them, we are basically pushing the rod towards this flat part, increasing the contact. And the middle grub screw here is a push screw and it will lock the contact in once you've done the adjustment with those two. It kind of, they all, they work all three together to do that. And so you want to find a point of contact where you can smoothly rake the focuser in and out properly. And you want to make sure that you don't have to use too much force to do so. Otherwise you could have like stiction from place to place. And if you're going to use a ZWEF, um, like I do on this telescope, then you might run into issues where the EF is no longer able to draw the draw tube in, especially when it's fighting against gravity, uh, the gravity of your camera. You also want to make sure that by pushing or pulling on this, you're not having like the draw tube immediately uh, be pushed in or out without having to use the knob. It's a very delicate balance and I finally achieved it with this. Uh, it's very difficult to just like to explain on video how to achieve that balance. You really have to try it out on your own. Okay, and that's it for the focuser itself. Now you might notice that around the focuser, I have some black tape. This is simple electric tape. This kind of stuff is awesome. It doesn't leave residue. It's flexible and it's opaque. And this is to avoid light leaks. And I've wrapped that black tape 
all at, across all places that could have a light leak, which I did by shining a flashlight on those surfaces to see where a light leak could happen and then correcting for the light leak by uh, adding this, uh, this black electric tape. Now, while I was doing so, I covered up some tilt adjustment screws for the actual focuser draw tube assembly, which I think I will need to mess with during further touch-ups of the telescope alignment. One of the other things that I did with the focuser assembly is I taped around the focuser draw tube itself. Obviously, taping the draw tube would prevent it from moving around, but my idea was that I could basically tape electrical tape and then rack it in so that it eats up the electrical tape, removing the gap that's between the draw tube and the focuser assembly. And it seems to have worked. I did two layers of electrical tape like this. And then when I tried to add one more layer, it started having issues racking in and out. So I removed the third layer. And with two layers, I seem to have found the perfect thickness of electrical tape to really isolate the draw tube from the focuser assembly. And when I shine a light now on it, there is no more light leakage. This is amazing. And I don't think I've seen anyone doing that before. And it seems to work well for me. So you might want to try it out. It uh, costs only a little bit of tape and it seems to be working really well. So hmm, have fun. And another thing that I did is I added electrical tape around here, the end of the uh, telescope where the primary mirror is effectively, effectively fitted in with the tube. And that stops light, le light leaks here from the side. There are going to be quite a few light leaks from the primary mirror itself. And so I ma made a little uh, butt plug. <laughs> I love that word, I'm so sorry. For the telescope and I can just like fit it in. Uh, a lot of people use a simple uh, shower cap, and I think that works great. I bought a shower cap, uh, but it was not opaque enough for me. So I have made my own little uh, butt plug for telescope, uh, and it seems to be working really well. Now, when I shine a flashlight on this, I see nothing at all, which is perfect. And in places like Tokyo or wherever you might have that weird white orb of brightness in the sky called the moon, which I think is pretty much everywhere, it's very important to protect the telescope ag against light leaks. And the final thing that I did, I recycled a 3D printed dew shield that I was using on my Celestrum C6. Right now I've, uh, I've put the Celestrum C6 back to the uh, flexible dew shield, shield that I've been using with it. This one is flocked, non-reflective, it works really well, and I can just like add it to the top and it fits there really well to avoid any stray light entering the tube. So with all of that, I'm really good with light leaks. I mean, I think I've done all I can to prevent them. I also kind of wanted to remove the primary mirror assembly, which is very easy. You just like remove four screws and then you can just pull the primary mirror assembly right out. And I wanted to mask out the mirror clips. There are three mirror clips on the primary mirror that hold the primary mirror in place. And uh, they do make the stars look a bit weird. And so I wanted to add a mask and 3D print a mask to put around the mirror. I actually did remove the primary mirror. I looked at it, I took measurements so I can design and print my own mask. Although there are uh, such masks available directly from uh, vendors like Backyard Universe. I'll put the link down in the description. Backyard Universe actually contacted me also to provide me with like a set of enhancements for the Quattro 150p. For now, I said no, because I want to keep my telescope as ghetto as possible. And so for this video, I wanted to not do that because I just wanted to do the classical stuff that don't involve taking the telescope apart uh, so that beginners can follow along while not being too stressed out. Maybe in later videos, I will take Backyard Universe on his uh, offer and uh, and try things out to really pimp up the scopes. But for now, I'm staying as ghetto as possible. Please let me know what you think in the comments, whether I should like really pimp this, co this scope up because right now it's been a nightmare or if I could just like stay with the cheapest thing possible and not spend another dime on top of the $450 that I already spent on it. Let me know down in the comments. While you're at it, you may want to leave a like, uh, leave a dislike, leave a comment subscribe to the channel and uh, you could also join the channel to support me or join my Patreon to also support me. My Patreons, my channel members, I am so thankful because they truly make the channel possible. And if that sounds like something you'd like to do, well, 
The links are also in the description. Now let's go to the worst part of making this telescope usable, which is the collimation. The collimation on this thing was a complete nightmare. And I'm not exaggerating. I spent three hours before I could finally get good collimation. And it was collimation that was really difficult to realize that things were wrong in the first place. Now, this video is not going to be a full tutorial on collimation because there are a lot of good tutorials already. I'll put some links in the description um, and feel free to go and have a look. I'll talk about how difficult were the tough parts of the collimation were with this particular telescope. Because what happened is I first tried with a collimation laser. And with a collimation laser, I'm just able to insert the laser inside the focuser tube. Uh, there might be a little bit of tilt on the laser. There's all sorts of things that can go weird with a collimation laser. So I'm not going to go into the details. But here I had the laser into the draw tube. And by looking at the primary mirror, I could see that uh, uh, the laser was properly centered on the primary mirror. I did have to do a few adjustments using a screwdriver on, on the three screws that help adjust the uh, secondary mirror tilt. And then I very easily adjusted the primary mirror so that the laser pointer would then come back to the source. Okay, everything looked fine. And I double checked with my Cheshire eyepiece, which is another collimation tool. And the Cheshire eyepiece agreed, like everything was lined up. My secondary mirror was properly pointing to the center of the primary mirror. And the center of the primary mirror was properly pointed back towards my eye, so or my Cheshire eyepiece. So everything seemed to be fine. That, yet this apparent perfect collimation was terrible. And the symptom has been the weird oval ring that I've shown in my previous video. And so with the symptom, I, I, I thought at first that this symptom was caused by light leaks, but now that I had covered all of the possible light leaks, um, I still saw the symptom. So I was like, what? is happening. And so I used, I 3D printed and used a small collimation cap. And a collimation cap is simply a very, very simple device with a small pinhole in the middle that we can use to sight the secondary mirror. And when I placed the collimation cap into the visual back and had a look, I noticed that despite everything being aligned well, within the secondary mirror, I could not see the reflection of the whole primary mirror. And a dead giveaway to that is simply I could not see all three of the mirror clips uh, on that primary mirror in the secondary reflection. And if you think about it, all of the light that gets gathered by the telescope goes to the primary mirror, is focused onto the secondary mirror, and then is reflected back to the camera or our eyes. And if you don't see the whole of the primary mirror in the secondary, you have a problem because some of the light is just like hitting outside of the secondary, causing reflections, causing tons of issues, and you want all of the light to be hitting the secondary mirror, otherwise you're gonna really have trouble. And there are several steps that I had to take to take care of that and to have the primary mirror properly visible in the secondary mirror while everything was also aligned. I could still have the laser pointer of, on my Cheshire eyepiece perfectly center the uh, primary mirror in the secondary and vice versa. First, I had to play with this center screw here. And this center screw helps move the secondary mirror that you can see here uh, further inside the tube or towards the opening. And I had to move it quite a ways towards the inside of the tube. So that was a first step. To make this work, if you want to move the secondary mirror further inside the tube, you need to actually loosen this screw. And if you want to move the secondary mirror towards the opening, you need to actually tighten the screw. Now, there are th those three screws are separately pushing on the base of the secondary mirror. So if you want to pull the uh, secondary towards the opening of the tube, you need to loosen those three screws first. And when you're pushing the secondary towards the inside of the tube, since you're loosening that screw, well, that screw, it ends at some point. So your secondary mirror might fall off. So you need to make sure that you're holding it with one hand while you're loosening with the other hand. It's a bit painful. And you can do that and have a sight tube that comes from the focuser assembly, whose tube we can see here, to really center the mirror. 
But for very fast Newtonians, there's a bit of an offset there. So even when you've centered it perfectly, it might not be quite perfect. So that's one operation that I had to do. And then the second operation was trying to play with those three screws to achieve an alignment that really worked. And I could not for the life of me make it work. So I either had like the mirrors perfectly aligned and uh, and so on, on paper with a Cheshire eyepiece or with a laser, the collimation was perfect. But in that case, the primary mirror at the back was not fully reflected in the secondary or I could have the primary mirror at the back be fully reflected in the secondary, but then the alignment was poor. So it was very annoying until I did something that everyone says you should absolutely not do, which is do your collimation, especially your secondary coll mirror collimation with the telescope pointing up. And that's absolutely what I did. With the telescope pointing up, with the secondary mirror loose, gravity worked in my favor and I was able to actually keep the mirror in place so that I was finally able to adjust the mirror rotation and tilt so that they all agreed with one another and I could have the primary mirror fully reflected in the secondary while both my laser and Cheshire eyepiece showed that they were good aligned optics. This took me literally hours. And I had to do one final adjustment, which was using the screws here that are kind of like 90 degrees to the focuser draw tube to actually uh, move the secondary towards this direction, so away from the camera. And so for once, gravity, which you must obey because it's the law, helped us. Uh, obviously, when doing that, I needed to be extremely careful not to drop anything onto the primary mirror because I have to use a screwdriver to do all of those adjustments and dropping a screwdriver onto a primary mirror is usually not a good idea. But now that we're done and the battle seems to be over, there is one more step I need to do to claim victory. <laughs> and it's actually testing the telescope under the stars because yes, all of those manipulations, I did them this morning, I haven't tested them on the stars yet. I know I will have some focuser draw tube tilt and I'll need to fix that tilt, which will require me to adjust the secondary a bit again and then the primary a bit again, but the primary is the easy part. But for the moment, I want to see whether my reflections issue is fixed by properly doing the collimation, including using a collimation cap that truly made me see the problem and the error of my ways. So tonight is the full moon, it's the perfect night for tests. It should be clear. Let's try this out together and see whether this cheap telescope has been an absolute nightmare to make work. See if we can actually make it work and if all of my efforts were in vain or not. Have I achieved victory? Let's see. We're the following day. I did manage to get a few frames on M51 during the full moon and with actually clouds streaming through and wind of over 30 kilometers per hour. Not the best conditions for imaging. My guiding was very respectable for arc seconds RMS. <laughs> so yeah, not, uh, not the best, but I did manage to get an image uh, and I get got around 30 minutes of data on the image. Now, before we look at the result on that particular image, let's look at what we had prior to achieving this good collimation. So the image that you see here is M51. When I had the uh, collimation done properly using just the Cheshire eyepiece and laser, which were agreeing with one another. So my optics were well aligned, but behind the scenes, unbeknownst to me, the primary mirror was not fully reflected in the secondary, which means that a lot of the light from the primary was not making it onto the secondary and thus was not being reflected to the main imaging camera. And it was probably introducing reflection issues, at least that's what I hope and believe was happening. So for reference, this is with those so under those collimation conditions, this was the result. We had this weird shadow here going on like ring shadow, which I thought was reflections. But in this imaging session, I had done all of the improvements that I showed you earlier in the video in terms of closing any light leaks that I could find. And this still happened, like no change whatsoever. I went as far as like covering the whole imaging train except the telescope aperture under a blanket. 
and looking at the flat frame that resulted from that. And in the flat frame, just like before, I saw this shape. So definitely something else than light leaks. Um, okay, so this image was there. So what I did to try to make it better is some automatic background extraction. The donut here is still very visible and very distracting. Uh, then I removed the stars and did an extremely aggressive dynamic background extraction with a very low smoothing factor, which is something that can do on galaxy images, but it's much less workable on nebulae images, for instance. So this is really a best case scenario where we can see the ring is still visible embossed on the image, uh, but better than uh, than before. And then placing back the stars, it's almost unnoticeable, but still there. So it's very difficult to get fully rid of that really annoying ring. Okay, and now let's look at the image that I was able to get yesterday. Again, remember these were less than ideal conditions with clouds streaming through. So it's at a disadvantage. And it's difficult to tell exactly what is the results of clouds and what could be the results of leftover internal reflections. But the first thing that I notice on the image is I do not see that weird oval shape at all. And that is excellent news. If I do an automatic automatic background extraction, it's still not there. We still have we have this like kind of little thing here. I don't know whether this is linked to just clouds streaming through our remaining internal reflections. Uh, maybe my next step in my journey will be to flock the inside of my scope tube so that I avoid internal reflections even more. And then maybe I'll get a perfect image. But you can see it looks much better even with just an automated background extraction. But I gave this image the same treatment as before. So I removed the stars and did a very aggressive dynamic background extraction. And it does look much, much better, much, much flatter than the previous image. And again, this is with cloud streaming, very strong wind, and only 30 minutes of imaging time from Tokyo. So I will call that a wind. If we zoom into the image, uh, we can see star trailing, but that's normal with 30 kilometers per hour winds. And the corner of the image on my APS-C size sensor are actually really good. So now I think I finally have like the proper telescope that I was promised for $450. So here we are, I finally fixed the collimation. I think this was a very difficult thing to do uh, because first you have to notice the issue. You have to realize that the symptoms are not actual light leak symptoms, but collimation symptoms, that's really hard. And I think like Skywatcher really did a bad job delivering the, the scope uh, in terms of collimation because there were two big issues there. One was that the scope was extremely far off good collimation. I had to really like make the secondary mirror go deeper into the tube by a lot. And it was really, really bad. And second is even though the scope was out of good collimation by a lot, it appeared to be close to good collimation if you're using just a Cheshire eyepiece. So it had the effect of deceiving me. And I'm an experienced astrophotographer, uh, even though I'm not a professional with Newtonian and Newtonian collim collimation. But you can see how difficult this would be for beginners. So this is a very enticing telescope for uh, budget astrophotographers just $450 in Japan with uh, the coma corrector slash focal reducer, you get a decent aperture of 150 millimeters, you get an extremely fast focal ratio of 3.45. For that price, it's absolutely amazing. And on my APS-C size sensor, we get good star shapes across the field of view, which is mind boggling to me. And the scope is slightly more expensive in the United States and maybe in Europe as well. Uh, but that's likely due to the fact that you have a better focuser. So something to keep in mind. But notwithstanding those advantages of the telescope, the initial alignment of the optics was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. I loved every moment of it. And my shoulders and neck are completely sore from contorting into various positions to be able to like do adjustments while looking through my collimation cap. It was beautiful. But uh, if you're a beginner, yeah, keep that in mind. You'll have to learn a lot about collimation. You'll have to get proper collimation tools. I'll put links in the description and you, re you, will, you will really have to spend time to tame this beast of, the, of a telescope. 
but if you do, the rewards are sweet. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video into taming this budget telescope, which was really a difficult thing to do even for me. And I hope this helps you guys if you have a Quattro telescope uh, and more specifically this particular one, the 150P, and you're seeing those weird reflection issues, even though you've like closed all of the light leaks and plugged the tube and done so much and the collimation appears right, maybe your collimation only appears to be right and it actually isn't. Have a look with a collimation cap and, uh, and see whether you can actually see the full primary mirror reflected in the secondary. With that, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all of my channel members and Patreon supporters. You guys truly make the channel possible. Uh, if you're interested in supporting me, you can go and check the links in the description below. As always, subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, tell me what you want me to do a video on next because I'm kind of like running out of ideas, so let me know. With that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and at the full moon, and I'll see you next time.